to throw to Lyndall Curtis, our political editor, with Capitol Hill in Canberra. Thanks, Kim. Tonight, Indonesia downgrades its relationship with Australia as surveillance concerns hit closer to home. This is Capitol Hill. Welcome to the program. I'm Lyndall Curtis and we are standing by for a press conference from the Greens leader Christine Milne on the debt issue. But before then, as Indonesia considers the relationship with Australia over spying, there are concerns inside Parliament that politicians themselves are under surveillance. The independent Senator Nick Xenophon is pushing for legal changes to provide greater safeguards over the phone records of politicians and journalists. The Australian Federal Police confirmed earlier this week it has obtained authorisation to access the phone records of a handful of federal politicians. I spoke to Senator Xenophon earlier today. Nick Xenophon, welcome to Capitol Hill. From the evidence you've been given, are MPs being spied on? Well, it's clear from the interchange I had with AFP Commissioner Negus uh, just a couple of days ago uh, that they are being, not maybe not spied on, maybe it's too provocative a word, but their phone records, their email records are being intercepted in a sense. Um, and in the context of Section 70 and 79 Crimes Act investigations, these are the investigations that relate to whistleblowers and I think it's very concerning that uh, it's easy to get an authorisation. You don't need a court order, you don't need a warrant to find out whom an MP has been speaking to, uh, who they've been communicating to via email, uh, a metadata search, and we just don't have the safeguards in place. And it doesn't affect just MPs, who might be talking to whistleblowers, but every journalist in this country as well. Do you know the extent of it? Uh, how many MPs it's affected, what, what they were looking well, for and what they got? In the initial interchange back in May, the Federal Police Commissioner said he didn't think there were any MPs subject to these authorisation orders. Uh, he then responded uh, quite properly to say, well, look, there are some. And on Monday, he said it was less than five. So, uh, but there have been authorisations. So it's between one and four, I guess. But if it's in the context of uh, a constituent, a public servant, with serious concerns about malfeasance or corruption or some other important public issue, coming to an MP for assistance and those details can be obtained of whom you'd be speaking to by the AFP without a court order, then I think it's quite disturbing. Are there, are there not protections for how this information can be used under the Whistleblower well, Protections Act? Under, the, under our laws, in terms of metadata collection, there are something like 300,000 uh, authorisations each year from organisations from the AFP uh, all the way down to the Victorian Taxi Directorate um, uh, because they have the power, because of revenue and other collection uh, aspects, they've got the power to get metadata collections. Now, if it's in the context of a whistleblower investigation uh, or, or in the context of an unauthorised leak under Section 70 or 79 of the Crimes Act, I think there should be greater safeguards both for journalists and for MPs and for those coming forward. Are there any circumstances in which uh, this collection of information perhaps between MPs and whistleblowers would be legitimate? Well, I can't see it. If it's a, if it's a public interest issue, uh, if it's about the leak of information about malfeasance, maladministration within the public service, uh, within government, then I think that is something that ought to be subject to greater scrutiny and protection. Uh, if an MP is involved in corrupt activity, if they're taking bribes, uh, if they're involved... Uh, with any other sort of nefarious activities that relate to criminal activity, then fair enough, they should be subject to the same rules as everybody else, as should journalists. But we're talking now about the chilling effect that these authorisations, these metadata swoops, can have on free speech, on individuals coming forward to both MPs uh, and to journalists. And we know now from Professor Fernandez's uh, outline earlier today how easy it is to track down who's been seeing whom, who's been communicating with whom and where. And that can really be of great assistance, as the AFP's conceded, in uh, a leak investigation. Uh, sh should leaks, though, be investigated because there are some leaks that, that uh, the person leaking might regard as legitimate, but, uh, but the government might not? Well, I think um, that governments get embarrassed by leaks, governments of any persuasion. Uh, but if the key, the key test should be, is it in the public interest for this information to be revealed? 
it was in the public interest, for instance, a number of years ago, for Alan Kessing's reports to be released, to be leaked to the media about uh, real issues, real problems with airport security, which were subsequently vindicated in an independent report. Now, Alan Kissing to this day, and I believe him, denies leaking those reports, but he was dragged through the courts, had his life ruined through a court process. Um, and that's where we'll leave it. We'll cross now to a press conference from the Greens leader, Christine Mellon. ...that when the government is asking to extend the credit card to 500 billion, they're wanting to do it over the Ford estimates. This is not about urgency. It's clear that the 400 billion that we have offered the government uh, will be enough to deal with the December uh, debt ceiling issue, and the government is then in a position to come back at a later time and ask for more. Repeatedly, Treasury Secretary Martin Parkinson was asked about the urgency of the 500 billion and repeatedly he simply talked about the Ford estimates. He kept talking about 15, 16, 16, 17. But the issue is Joe Hockey has said he wants to extend the credit card to 500 billion right now. Treasury Secretary Martin Parkinson has confirmed the Greens' position that there isn't that urgency in order to meet the December deadline. If the government wants to provide more information than was able to be provided by Treasury Secretary Parkinson, then the government should bring forward the uh, MAIFO. If it doesn't, then there is nothing on the record to say that there's anything other than convenience behind Treasurer Hockey's demand for 500 billion by December. 400 billion's on the table, that's all that's required, and it's time to have a sensible discussion about what the government wants to spend the money on. When I asked uh, Treasury Secretary what exactly do they need the money for beyond uh, what is already there, he said, oh, well, that'll be up to the government to announce whatever programs. That's why we need the uh, mid-year economic forecast results to be able to tell us exactly what the government wants its credit card extended for. But to date, there's no urgency for 500 billion. 400 billion will cover it. Unless the government brings forward my EFO, that'll be the way it stands. Mr Parkinson also said that it'd be prudent to raise the debt uh, limit to, to $500 billion. Well, the reason uh, Treasury Secretary is saying $500 billion is he's talking over the Ford estimates. And clearly the government wants the $500 billion extension to the credit card. Joe Hockey doesn't want to have to come back to the parliament at a later date and ask for more. But if you look at the history of the debt ceiling, the last two occasions that uh, it was uh, increased were within 12 months of each other. So the issue here is there's no need to provide it over the Ford estimates. You can come back and ask for it when you need it, and that's my invitation to the government. Uh, the we will give you $400 billion now. That's exactly uh, what it will cover the, the December uh, debt ceiling issue and then we can talk to the government then if it's not prepared to actually give the people what it wants to spend the money on. Uh, that's one of the reasons why the Coalition says it wants to try and do this once and once only to, to avoid having a, uh, a, a political fight over this over, over repeated years. I mean, isn't that a fair request? Well, the Coalition wants to do this once and once only because it recalls how irresponsibly the Coalition behaved in opposition when it came to issues around the debt ceiling. What we're saying is it's time to examine the whole issue of the debt ceiling, but in the short term, $400 billion is more than enough to cover what is needed. And if the government needs more than that in the short term, it needs to come out and show the people and the parliament why, and that's the MAIFO statement. If it wants to bring that out now, well and good. But otherwise, this is to avoid having to justify more borrowings later. That really isn't an ex convenience, is not a reason for extending the national credit card to 500 billion at the same time as you are running down revenue. Because no doubt, Mr. Hockey doesn't want to have to justify to people why he wants to extend the credit card at the same time as he's knocking back the potential to raise money. We've still got the deadline coming up in a few weeks' time. Uh, there's still time for negotiations. Uh, are the Greens leaving that option open? Well, of, of, the, of negotiating well, well, to negotiate with the Coalition? Well, the Treasury Secretary has made it quite clear today that there is no urgency for $500 billion. That's a Ford Estimates question. 
400 billion will cover what's necessary for December. If the government wants more and can justify more for the short term, it needs to come out and provide the MAIFA figures. Thank you. And that was the Greens leader, Senator Christine Milne, talking about today's evidence at a Parliamentary Senate Estimates Committee from the Treasury Secretary, Dr Martin Parkinson, on the issue of increasing the debt ceiling. Not long before that was the Shadow Treasurer, Chris Bowen. Both are saying they, their minds have not been changed by the evidence, to not been changed to agree to the government's move to increase the debt ceiling from $300 to $500 billion. Joining me in the studio now is our regular panel, Green Senator Lee Rhiannon and Parliamentary Secretary Josh Frydenberg. Welcome to you both. Nice well, to be here. Lee. This is usually a foreign affairs panel, which we'll <laughs> get to in a minute, but we'll talk about the debt first. Uh, Josh, you don't yet have the agreement of either the Labor Party or the Greens to increase the debt ceiling. The issue will come back to the Senate uh, the week after next. Mm. In the end of March, you have to accept the compromise position, the increase to 400 rather than $500 billion? Look, we are certainly hoping we get the $500 billion debt ceiling through the parliament. And let's remind your viewers, Lyndall, that this is not the government's debt. This was Labor's debt. We were bequeathed you know, $300 billion of debt and climbing. If you look internationally, both in the United States and Europe, there are some cold economic winds. Uh, we saw the standoff in the US Congress between Republicans and Democrats about lifting the debt ceiling. We don't want that level of uncertainty here in Australia. And what Martin Parkinson said today uh, to the Senate estimates was that it would be prudent to lift the debt ceiling and that it would also be useful to have a buffer, which the Office of Financial Management suggested there should be. So taking that all into account, we think 500 billion is the right number. Uh, Lee, Dr Parkinson did use the example of what had happened in the United States, not necessarily saying it would happen in Australia, but eventually effectively saying that international investors look at these debates and they get a mm. bit nervous. If, if the debt limit is going to have to be increased beyond $400 billion anyway, why not do it now, do it once and get it out of the way? Well, the testimony has been really quite clear today and all the coalition would need to do, because the evidence isn't there right now that it needs to go to $500 billion, is to come back to Parliament at some later stage and put their case, because the case has not been established now. And with regard to the international situation and what happened in the United States, that really should be a warning to the coalition, because they're the ones who are creating the scare around the debt. Because let's remember this week, they've actually actually wound up some important revenue measures um, when they've moved on the mining tax. So we have to bring those threads together. Uh, uh, Josh, you haven't yet, the government hasn't yet released uh, MIEFO, the Mid-Year Economic and Fiscal Outlook. Why not release that to provide the evidence to back your case? Well, the evidence is there today from Martin Parkinson, Lindell. And the point is... Not the for Australia, 500 billion, the, the, well, though, Josh. He, No, he actually said that uh, the debt is rising up to $370 billion, that it's prudent to have that 50 to $60 billion worth of buffer. And that, he said, would be based on a very optimistic outlook of the economy. And we know that there are some cold winds. And now, Lee is wrong to suggest that by cutting the mining tax, we are taking away revenue. In fact, the mining tax has only produced $400 million worth of revenue. But there's been you know, uh, over $10 uh, billion worth of spending, far more than that. And so you know, money has been spent on the basis of revenue that has not come in. And that's why the mining tax has to go. Well, we've got a bit of uh, Martin Parkinson's evidence to the Senate estimates to play. Here's what he had to say. The choice of a $500 billion limit seems prudent if we to uh, place a premium on ensuring financial market confidence. Were we to settle on a debt limit that was less than the anticipated prudent amount, it would be entirely reasonable for financial market participants here and overseas to wonder what might happen when what was clearly inevitable on current pathways came to occur. Now, Lee, uh, Martin Parkinson did say the debt was going to increase over time. He did say that nominal GDP is expected to be lower, growth is expected to be lower, and revenues are still not meeting forecasts. Doesn't that tell you that over time, the debt limit's going to have to go up. And I'll, I'll put the question to you I put before, if, if, if it's going to be needed anyway, why not just do it once? 
Well, I think if you listen to all of the testimony, the case wasn't established why we need to go to a 500 billion um, ceiling, debt ceiling. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with coming back to Parliament. And again, it's how you manage debt, how you manage the economy. And going back to Josh's previous point about the revenue, part of the problem with the mining tax is that we ended up with a weaker form of it. We could have had much more revenue. We're talking about revenue coming into the government coffers, into the public coffers, and that was damaged because of what happened with the mining tax. This is a conversation about revenue that needs to come into the conversation about debt. Uh, Josh, the, the legislative, the, the need to go to Parliament to increase mm. the debt ceiling has only been part of the legislative agenda since 2008. Mm. Uh, why do we need it? Is there any thought of, of scrapping it and going back to the system that used to exist? Well, the great irony, Lyndall, was it was introduced by the Labor Party and, you know, there was a $75 million debt, billion dollar debt ceiling, then a $200 billion debt ceiling, then a two fifty, then a three hundred, and the government didn't uh, exceed, it didn't uh, get the Parliament's uh, support for increasing that uh, previously. Uh, look, I, I, I think, you know, governments see that as a measure to maintain uh, maintain some sort of rigour around the process. Uh, there are some who said, let's get rid of the debt ceiling altogether. But the point is, we do not want to put Australia in a position that our friends in the United States found themselves in. And we do not want greater economic certainty at a time when there are some difficulties in the economy. So this is a prudent measure, and that's Martin Parkinson's words. We might move on now to uh, Australia's relations sure. with Indonesia. The Indonesian president, uh, Cecilia Bambang Yudhoyono, is having a press conference right at this moment. Uh, Indonesia correspondent George Roberts is there, and he's saying that uh, President Yudhoyono has announced that Indonesia is suspending military cooperation with Australia on people smuggling. Josh, we heard earlier today that Indonesia was going to downgrade its relations relationship with Australia, but we didn't know what that would entail. This is a sign of that, isn't it? Look, this is a very difficult issue uh, between the two countries, but you know, Tony Abbott uh, said exactly the right thing when he went to Parliament uh, on this issue and said, look, we do not comment on the specific nature of intelligence matters. That's not a coalition position, that's been a bipartisan tradition in an Australian foreign policy and intelligence matters. The other thing he said, Lyndall, was that all governments right around the world collect information and they do that to protect their own people and to support their allies and friends. And we understand the importance of the Indonesia-Australia relationship. We don't want to do anything to jeopardise that. And I'm very confident that you know, things will calm down and the relationship will go uh, from strength to strength over time. In, indeed, there have been reports over the years about Australia spying on Indonesia and about Indonesia spying on Australia. Isn't, though, the problem that Australia's response is to some extent governed by how Indonesia reacts to it? No, I mean, look, you know, this is uh, an issue which is, you know, playing in uh, into the media in Indonesia and uh, you've heard some strong comments from Martin Nalagawa, the uh, Foreign Minister of Indonesia and also uh, the President. Um, look, Australia understands how important the relationship with Indonesia. I believe Indonesia understands how important the relationship with is in Australia. And if you look at the past relationship, we had real difficult times over East Timor, for example, but we were able to work through that. And look at the cooperation on the security side post Bali bombing. Uh, it's been just wonderful where we've built each other's uh, capacity on the trade relationship. There are more than 14,000 Indonesian students studying in Australia. Um, there are much bigger uh, interests at play here, mutual interests, and I'm very confident that uh, the relationship will get back to an even keel over time. Uh Lee, Australia's just been through an election and these allegations are from when Labor, the revelations are from when Labor was in power. Indonesia's about to face elections, including presidential elections. How much of Indonesia's response should be seen through the prism of its own domestic politics? Oh, I, I imagine that that's a very big factor, but we... Um, we're Australians, we're parliamentarians, and we have a responsibility to examine what has happened here. And firstly, with regard to Josh's comments, he naturally has been very kind to his Prime Minister. He said he commented on the situation. I mean, really, it was a brush off the way he has handled the Indonesian situation. And that isn't good uh, for rebuilding the relationship. And we really could take a leaf out of how President Obama uh, handled the situation with spying 
spying his country, spy on Germany, where he did give an apology quite quickly. Oh, that's, that's not clear that, that he actually apologised. There's, a, I think, a report come from the German side, but not from the American side. He did... He did give a commitment that they wouldn't do it again. I don't think he apologised mm. even. Well, uh, there's been the reports that from Germany that he apologised and certainly there was the commitment that it wouldn't be done again. But there does need to be that clear statement of drawing the line in the sand if the relationship is to improve. But the, but the Greens in the past haven't been afraid of uh, criticising Indonesia quite strongly over things like the live cattle trade, over West Papua. Why are you worried about... Uh, Indonesia's response on this issue. Well, and we will continue to raise those issues, but the, the diplomatic relations, there is a complexity to them. And clearly, particularly when it's one's own neighbour, you still want to have that close communication. And at the moment, that's clearly been set back, as we've heard from the President's own press conference at the moment. But what this also opens up is how our spy agencies are working. Because let's remember how this story that broke this week about Australia spying on the Indonesian president and his wife came about. It was because that information was shared with the US spy agency and then that's what Mr Snowden has released. So in the name of, remember, spying is supposed to make Australia more secure, but in fact it's actually undermining our security, our diplomatic relations, how we're sharing it with another country and the leaks that are, that are occurring. So what I go back to, I think we need to go back to the need for an inquiry into the overreach of spy agencies in this country. Uh, Josh, sharing information, particularly with close allies, is not unusual, is Absolutely it? Absolutely common course. And Do we have any recourse, though? Does Australia have any recourse to speak to the United States about the fact that this information was leaked? leaked? Well, look, you know, the Snowden revelations uh, and also you know, those that related to WikiLeaks, I believe, are extremely damaging. Uh, and, in fact, the head of MI6, Lindor, uh, said to a parliamentary inquiry in the United, in the United Kingdom that the ones who are... Uh, rubbing their hands with glee are the enemies of the United Kingdom and the United States. In fact, Al-Qaeda Al are the ones who are the great beneficiaries of this. So let's not be under any illusions. While it may make good copy and sell a few newspapers and, a, and be good f uh, for a discussion on a talk show, um, this is very damaging to the national interests of Australia and, uh, and to our friends and our allies. Uh, Lee, on the broader issue of the revelations from both uh, Edward Snowden and also from WikiLeaks, it's only information that comes from America and, and by its association Australia. It's not information from other countries, so we don't know what necessarily what other countries are doing, isn't it? We're only seeing a small part of the international picture. Yes, we are, we are. And going back to Josh's point about, you know, he's obviously critical of Mr Snowden, but uh, there is a serious problem with how these security agencies are working. He raises al-Qaeda and terrorist organisations, but with this huge amount of data that is now out there, um, the, the prison controversy, these latest scandals that have broken, who knows where all this intelligence is reaching? Because there is just oh, uh, um, a subservience from Australia, how we work work with the US spy agencies and there is an overreach well, by all these agencies. Well, this might, needs to be discussed. We might move on to the issue of uh, information collecting a little closer to home. We were hearing an interview before Christine Mellon stepped up with Nick Xenophon and we will put that whole interview up online. Um, the Federal Police Commissioner has confirmed a number of MPs have been subject to orders um, to, to obtain their communications records. Josh, do you know if you've ever been under surveillance? Had your phone tapped? I have no idea about that. Uh, but I, you know, in terms of those particular issues that Nick Xenophon has raised, um, they are reported in the Attorney General's annual report. The, whatever actions have been taken by the Federal Police have been done so in accordance with the law. Now, we might just go now. We have, we have a snippet of the press conference from the Indonesian President, Cecilio Bangbang Yudhoyono. It is a little difficult to understand, but as, uh, as we heard earlier, he's, he's announced uh, Indonesia is suspending cooperation over people smuggling. Saya tahu I know rakyat Indonesia kesal dan marah terhadap apa yang dilakukan oleh pihak-pihak Australia kepada Indonesia, kepada negara kita. And that was the Indonesian president. No doubt we will get more of that press conference through on ABC News 24 as the evening progresses. Uh, Lee, we were talking about the issue of... of uh, 
politicians' phones being being monitored, or, or at least the metadata from that. Do you know if you've ever been uh, your phone's ever been tapped? I, I don't know if it's ever been tapped, but the my ASIO file suggests that, which started when I was eight years old, actually, uh, which I again think highlights that ASIO isn't an organisation that works for the security of the country, but vested interests. And I and, think, and what, on what do you base that allegation? Well, I think if you look at the history of the organisation and there, that they have been very one-sided in who they spy on. They really spied on the progressive side of Australian society. And right now, what we've heard from Mr Negus, the head of Australian Federal Police, is that the um, that the, he hasn't ruled out that they're listening to MPs' phone conversations, but there's no but explanation. I, it, it, was, it was more collecting the metadata, wasn't it? Not necessarily listening to the content. Yes, but I, the report that I read that he didn't rule out that they could also be listening to phone conversations. It was certainly the metadata. Can I just say that, 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 yeah, that's a real slight on the hard-working men and women of the Australian Intelligence Agency. Look, Lyndall, let's make no apologies for our intelligence and security apparatus. They have been very successful in preventing, both in Australia and globally, a repeat of the horrific events of 9-11. And, you know, that is something uh, that we uh, can thank the people uh, who work in those intelligence agencies for. And that's where we'll have to leave it. Josh Frydenberg and Lee Rhiannon, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, thank Lyndall. You. Thanks, Josh. And that is Capitol Hill for this evening. We will be back at the same time tomorrow. Until then, good night.